Well, good afternoon and welcome to this ANZOG National Regulator Community of Practice webinar on AI and ChatGPT, the latest fad, a useful tool or something more nefarious. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am coming to you today from the lands of the Wundjeri people and pay my respects to elders past and present and any other Aboriginal people who've joined us today, wherever you are. Welcome. My name is Simon Corden. and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'm a former chair of the regulator, National Regulator Community of Practice and currently a part-time commissioner at Victoria's Essential Services Commission. As you'll see on screen, I'm also a poet with the support of G Cat Chat GPT, as you'll see on the slide. I'm not really a poet. Um, I particularly like Chat GPT's reference to avoiding industry capture at the end uh, um, for all the people, not just those who sway. Um, so uh, Chat GPT has many applications, and today we're going to hear some really interesting insights about it and its relevance for you as regulators. But my role as the chair of the, of the NR COP and the, my poetry is certainly not the reason I was asked to facilitate today. I'm also an independent public policy consultant. And last year I worked with Objective Corporation, which is an IT firm that specialises in supporting regulators, on a survey on the use of technology by Australian and New Zealand regulators. With the support of the Regulator Community of Practice and New Zealand's GREG, we got over 80 responses from a wide range, wide variety of regulators, which provided a great snapshot on the adoption of a, a pretty wide range of technologies from workflow management systems for licensing to apps, to digital licenses and drones and all sorts of technologies. But also importantly, uh, it included uh, surveying on the use of artificial intelligent tools to improve how people regulate. So you'll see from slide one here, um, that regulators that we surveyed recognise that artificial intelligence, for example, in the analysis of documents, could be relevant to their work. And 17% were piloting and even more planning or considering its use. But the actual adoption by regulators in their business as usual activity is very limited, only 2%. Now, that's the middle of last year we did this survey. Um, since that time, ChatGPT has overtaken the world, and there may be many more regulators experimenting with this technology, but the full adoption in practice would seem to be still quite limited. So um, other survey results, if you're interested in this survey, are available uh, in the report that's on Objective's website, and you can see a link to uh, this report in the Zoom Q&A box. Now, clearly, artificial intelligence is going to have a large effect on what we regulate as it changes practices right across the economy, perhaps even more than how we regulate. And I've been trying to think through this, how it might affect us as regulators. And the second slide that's coming up here will provide some examples. So you'll see um, in the bottom half of this slide, um, provides examples of how it might affect how we do our regulation as a regulators in practice, both in a positive and negative way. So we could get flooded by chat GPT written submissions or complaints. Um, we could have a lack of clarity about who's accountable for non-compliance, um, accidents with uh, self-driving vehicles, a classic example of that. I've been reading that people can get, when they do searches for advice on how they comply with regulation, they can get incorrect advice if they use something like ChatGPT. Seems very credible, but it might be correct advice as to how to apply in another jurisdiction. Um, so there's lots of ways it could be negative, but there's also ways it could have a positive impact in terms of chat bots to provide regulatory advice, uh, AI supported triage of notifications and complaints, um, AI supported data analysis, et cetera. But, but today we're going to focus on the top half of this uh, that slide, the, where we've got uh, academic experts who are going to provide insights in the various ways in which artificial intelligence could affect the world that we regulate. And there are examples of this in the top half of the slide. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Steve Lockie, a postdoctoral research fellow in organisational trust from the University of Queensland's Business School, and Dr. Caitlin Curtis, a research fellow from the University of Queensland Centre for Policy Futures. Now, their research in how artificial intelligence could affect the world around us should generate a lively discussion today. So as they move through their insights, please take the opportunity to submit your questions and vote on others that others submit, because um, we're aiming to make this uh, 
this exercise as uh, interactive as possible. So you'll see in the Q&A function in Zoom, you can add your own questions or you can um, uh, upvote or downvote other people's questions. So Caitlin and Steve uh, wrote a companion piece to this webinar called Regulation is the Key to Responsible Artificial Intelligence and what might this might look like. And this will pop up in a link in the, uh, the Zoom Q&A box for you. You can also find uh, this article on the ANZOG website. So before we get to our two, prevent, two presenters, let's run a quick poll to see how comfortable those of you are on the webinar today, are com how comfortable you are with AI. So we have an audience of about 500 regulators have registered for this uh, workshop. So let's see whether you're skeptical about AI or not. So if you can see that the, the poll is up on your screen. And then second one, which is a favorite of Lorraine from uh, NR Cop, she's asked, are you concerned you might lose your job to a bot? Certainly if I was a Shakespearean poet, I'd be worried. So if you can just uh, put your votes in now and shortly the results will pop up. I'm hoping that's going now. That's great. So 56% of you are skeptical about the use of AI in regulation uh, and 44% of you are not skeptical and 19% of you are worried you're going to lose your job to a bot. Well, let's hope that 19% is being overly pessimistic. Um, so now we're going to move on. I have the pleasure of passing over to the first of our presenters, uh, Dr. Caitlin Curtis, who will begin by giving us an overview of what AI is and exploring some of the associated risks. The Q&A function is available. And as I said earlier, I encourage you to submit your questions to our two experts who will answer them throughout the survey, uh, throughout the webinar. And remember, they are the experts who will be able to spot if you generate your questions using ChatGPT. So over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here speaking with you all. Um, so to start off, I think many of you will know about ChatGPT, and um, we loved that poem uh, from Simon. Uh, it's a large language model, uh, which is a type of artificial intelligence that can generate human-like responses to written text. ChatGPT is a generative AI, so these are AI tools that use machine learning to generate new content, including language, images, music, and even video. And what is AI more broadly? Uh, that's a great question. There are a lot of definitions of AI, and it is a bit of a moving landscape. One that I quite like is from the OECD, and they point out that AI can perform tasks or make predictions, recommendations, or decisions that usually require human intelligence. And they can do this based on objectives that are set by humans, but without explicit human instructions. And the potential benefits of AI span nearly every sector, and the impacts can be quite unexpected and transform transformative. And I, I just wanted to highlight one example here from 2022, where Google DeepMind predicted the shape of nearly every protein known to science. This might sound a bit obscure, but you know, proteins are, are the basic building blocks of life. We're all made up of proteins. So the ability to predict them opens up really important new possibilities for developing new drugs and pharmaceuticals. So really transformative. But along with the benefits, there are risks from AI. And so I just wanted to take a few minutes to touch on some of the issues that have been raised by systems like ChatGPT. And we only have time today to, to talk about a few of them, but a lot of these risks are applicable to AI systems in general and not just generative AI. So I'll start by mentioning accuracy, accountability, and the need for transparency when we're using these. Because one of the issues with these language models is that right now there's sometimes a problem with the accuracy of the information. So recently, Google launched its own AI language model, uh, which you may have seen called BARD. And right from the outset in the promotional video, BARD provided inaccurate information about the James Webb telescope, which ended up costing the company over $100 billion off its share price. 
And the point that I wanted to make here with this example is that these models get a lot of things right and they deliver the, the, the content in a very confident way, but they also sometimes get some basic things wrong. They may sound correct, but the underlying language model is in some senses kind of guessing the most likely next word rather than actually finding the definitive correct answer when you're making a query. And inaccurate information can impact real people. So in this example that you may have seen in the news, ChatGPT allegedly falsely identified a regional mayor from Victoria as being the guilty party in a foreign bribery scandal, when in reality, he was apparently a whistleblower. Regardless of the accuracy, there's also a potential for bias. Any AI model can perpetuate or amplify existing biases in the data, historical biases, the data that it's used to train on. And this is important for people to understand. So in this example, in this article by Fast Company, they use ChatGPT to write some generic performance reviews. And ChatGPT tended to fall into some gendered stereotypes with respect to the jobs. So jobs like kindergarten teachers versus construction workers, and also gendered stereotypes with re respect to the descriptors and the language they were using to describe the jobs and the roles. So analytical, confident, and strong versus words like bubbly and helpful, for example. And obviously this becomes especially important if it's linked to things like hiring applications, housing, and so forth. Privacy and security is another issue. ChatGPT was trained on large amounts of data that were taken from the web and without consent from things like articles, websites, and posts, including personal information. So there's a caution here that personal information can therefore potentially be leaked back out of the model. And at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a mechanism to check whether it has your personal information stored, and whether that information is correct and whether you can even have it deleted. And then there's another privacy risk that comes when we use the tool and when we ask it to answer questions for us, we may inadvertently put in sensitive information or confidential information into the model and into the database. And related to this, I wanted to mention that Italy recently temporarily blocked ChatGPT due to concerns about privacy and data and the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, until OpenAI addresses these concerns. So far, it's been a free service, but they've recently introduced a paid service. And it's just a good reminder that there are important issues to consider around equity and access to these tools. One issue with generative AI content is around intellectual property. And, and I, I think it's instructive to have a look back at what happened with the text to image tools that came out last year. So things like DALI2, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, uh, these are also generative AI tools like ChatGPT. And so these tools, again, they take large amounts of information from the web, and it's not always clear what information they're using as a source for the generative AI output. And so this ex example is really interesting. So it's from The Verge. And in this example, Getty Images are suing one of these companies, Stable Diffusion, for allegedly scraping their content. And if you have a close look at these images, you can see that the AI has even reproduced the Getty Images watermark into its generated images, if you have a close look. And thinking about intellectual property, there are actually three important points that have been termed the three C's, consent, compensation, and credit. And I, I wanted to credit Matthew Butterick. He's one of the attorneys in a recent class action lawsuit around artistic intellectual property. And he and his team have raised this idea of the three C's. And um, the challenges that they're raising in this lawsuit with the three C's, I think, are really important to keep in mind. Uh, they're, they're alleging that the artists had not consented to have their copyrighted artwork included in the database. 
Uh, they weren't compensated for their involvement, even though the companies like Midjourney are charging people to use their tools and generate output. And their influence wasn't credited when the AI images were produced using their work. Another risk is around fake information, misinformation, and deep fakes. And in the past few weeks, we have seen some really convincing fake information coming out of these generative AI tools. Here on the left, you may have seen this image uh, of the Pope wearing the Balenciaga puffer jacket. And on the right, the Trump arrest photos that were fabricated using artificial intelligence. So these images are pretty convincing, especially with a quick glance. And they have a tendency to circulate really rapidly across social media really widely before people have a chance to really um, realize that they're fake. So these tools are really good and they're very accessible. So now pretty much anyone can create pretty convincing fake images and content. So it's quite likely that we will see an increase in misinformation and disinformation. And it isn't just images. Um, as we've talked about, um, these tools can generate sounds and they can also generate uh, video. So, and we can also use these AI tools to replicate someone's voice and make them say new things or appear to say new things. And this may provide a new way for hackers and bad actors to bypass existing security system. So you can see from this example that some potential security concerns um, have been raised relating to access to government services. And just finally, uh, I'd like to just touch on the impact of AI on jobs, which is complex and uncertain. So for example, Goldman Sachs recently published a report projecting that AI could re replace the equivalent of 300 million full-time jobs. And they also said that it could replace a quarter of work tasks in the United States and Europe. But they, they point out, of course, that this is extremely complex and it could also mean the creation of new jobs and a productivity boom. And they project that generative AI could eventually increase the total annual value of goods and services that are produced globally by 7%. So aside from the job loss, there are also issues like how do we upskill our workforce and the potential for de-skilling relating to AI um, by uh, over-reliance on AI in our daily work. And I like to think of that as kind of being similar to the Google Maps effect, where a lot of us are no longer able to maybe navigate as well as we used to. So at this stage, I wanted to just pause and I would really like to hear from you um, about how do you feel about these risks in your areas of expertise? Uh, feel free to pop a comment into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll just stop here for a brief pause, maybe one to two minutes um, while you um, respond. Like, how do you view these risks in your areas of expertise? Which of these risks maybe are the most challenging? Um, and we can take a few minutes and go through those. Oh, I think they're coming in. And just as questions uh, come through, Caitlin, just as a quick aside, um, it's it's really interesting um, with you know with Italy banning the use of Chat GPT. There's been a spike in uh, Italian users of VPNs, virtual virtual private networks, that has coincided with um, that ban. Um, so there is the suggestion that perhaps. Um, you know, Italians are looking for a way to circumvent uh, <laughs> this, this ban. Yeah, yeah. So that's a question around whether you know whether trying to ban these kinds of uh, systems outright, whether if that's an appropriate way to go, whether it's you know whether it will actually have the the intended effect. Just something to think about. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm concerned about data breaches. Um, reading here through the Q&A, thank you so much. Um, from a data security perspective, how can regulators comfortably use ChatGPT to process sensitive information if it can be retrained and leaked to other GPT questioners? 
Is the future perhaps a closed circuit generative AI that can process confidential information without storing that data? Uh, that's a really interesting question uh, and suggestion. And I unfortunately don't have the answer I wish I did, but I think these are all things that we sh should be thinking about. And I know that um, some closed circuit um, chat GPT uh, instances are already being developed and used commercially in, in, in house, um, which may do exactly what you're suggesting. Yeah, my, my, my suggestion would be, you know, if you wouldn't want someone um, to become party to any, any kind of information, don't put it into chat GPT. Um, you know, there was a, a case a couple of weeks ago where Samsung, um, that there, there, there was uh, leak, leak, data leaks of, of Sam, Samsung's um, IP because some of their um, employees had, had taken internal meeting notes with very sensitive information and, and sort of, and, and fed it into chat GPT uh, and it was leaked. And so, you know, that probably, in a, probably in a very costly way to, to Samsung. So, you know, I, I think you're right, Caitlin. I, I, think, I think more and more organizations are going to develop their own, um, you know, closed loop enterprise versions of these kinds of systems. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be putting any kind of sensitive information into the likes of ChatGPT. Mm. And someone has asked here, is there a greater need for education in visual literacy and image making so that people are more aware of what could be a fake image? I, I, mean, th I think that is such a great question. And I absolutely feel that uh, uh, public AI literacy to help the public to navigate these new challenges and help policymakers and everyone um, sort of start to be um, navigating these challenges and um, thinking about how uh, to that, that that whole idea of transparency and understanding when and if we're interacting with artificial content and AI systems is a really important one. I might just I'm conscious of time. I might just. Hand back to you, Simon, if you want us to keep going. No, I think that's great. I mean, the discussion to date has, uh, this introduction has focused on the negatives of AI and chat GPT, but clearly there's lots of ways that it can be beneficial in terms Absolutely. of providing better services. So I, th I think as regulators, we tend to focus on the risks and the harms, which is our role, but we should also be very cognizant of not um, avoiding or hindering the ability to get the positives of, of AI. So that's what's going to be the, the challenge, I suppose. So now I'm going to hand over to Steve Lockie, who will give us uh, some insights from the research they've been conducting on public trust uh, in AI across 17 countries, including Australia. And I think you had 17,000 respondents, hopefully all people, Steve. But um, <laughs> uh, and, and I'll hand over to you. So over, over to you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Simon. And we, we did, um, that's a good point. Um, that there were a few bots slipped through and we, we did remove them from our data set. Um, um, so yeah, but that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting point that even e bots can even infiltrate academic research. Um, so, but before I get started on um, you know, discussing some of our, our results, uh, I just want to note that we, we produced this research in collaboration with KPMG, and that Professor Nicole Gillespie um, led the UQ research team, which also consisted of myself, Caitlin, and our colleague, uh, Javid Poole. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this work, you'll find the full report linked with the companion materials uh, to this webinar, or you could contact myself uh, or Caitlin, and we'll gladly send you a copy. It's, 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 it's all free to access. Um, because really what I focus on here is just a very small snapshot of a very large report. Um, and I'm going to focus particularly on the public's uh, perceived benefits and risks of AI, um, and also the expectations that they have around regulation. Um, and I hope, I hope you'll find this informative because, you know, regulation to my mind really exists to protect citizens and to improve public outcomes and pr promote public values. So, I think it's really important then to understand 
what concerns and expectations the public have in, in, in this regard. Um, it's so our research insights um, are based on survey data, um, which as Simon said, we, we collected in, in the 17 countries you see here. We had over uh, at least a thousand responses per country um, and the data were nationally representative on age, gender and uh, location. Um, it's important to note that, you know, like Simon's work that he, he mentioned earlier, our data were collected last year. We collected, we collected the data between September and October. So clearly prior to the, the chat GPT boom. So, you know, that, that is something to bear in mind as I, as I talk with the results here. Um, so in terms of benefits then, we can see that most people expect AI to result in a range of benefits as we see here. Um, and it's notable actually that Australia ranks lowest in the sample in this respect. So where we find that actually only 70% of Australians have at least uh, moderate expectations that AI, AI will produce the, the kind of range of benefits that you see here. And it's also notable that what we term as the, the kind of the process benefits of AI, uh, such as improving efficiency and innovation, um, are seen as greater than what we call the, the people benefits, um, such as improving outcomes for people, enhancing what people can do, and enhancing decision making. And it's also quite interesting that while most people expect AI to produce a range of benefits, only half of the sample actually believe that the benefits of AI will outweigh the risks. And this drops to a minority of people in, um, in Western countries, um, in, including in Australia. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the risks then, here we actually see considerable consistency across countries in the way that risks are, are perceived. Um, we see that 73% of people are concerned about the potential risks shown here. And again, in Australia, this actually increases to over 80%. So again, it, it certainly seems that Australians, uh, you know, they, they, they're more likely to think that AI is going to be risky and, and cause harm than, than, you know, have the range of benefits that I, I mentioned earlier. And in all countries, people actually rated the cyber security risk um, as their top one or two concern. And in every single country, this potential for bias was, was the lowest ranked concern. And that was one of the things that really sort of shocked me as I was analyzing the data. Um, yeah, people really saw the potential for bias as a lesser risk than, than many of the others that we, we see here. Um, and I think what these results speak to is really the need to protect people's data and privacy in order to secure and preserve trust. And also to, yeah, I think it also supports that you know, we can take global approaches to managing and mitigating AI risks uh, across countries. So we can take a, you know, really joint approach. Um, and one of these sort, one of these kinds of approaches is, is develop the development of trustworthy or ethical AI principles um, that developers and organizations can use to ensure responsible development and deployment of, of AI. Um, and in order to determine which principles and practices are important for people to, to actually be able to trust in AI, we asked about 16 practices um, associated with the principles we see here. And these practices, these principles, sorry, reflect the European Commission principles for trustworthy AI. And they're also broadly reflective of the Australian government's um, AI ethics framework and the principles um, included in, within that framework. And, and uh, Caitlin's gonna talk a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment. Um, but I think what we see here is a, a really strong global public endorsement for these principles. And this could act as a blueprint for developing and using AI in a way that really is supportive of, of public trust. And so in terms of um, regulation then, the large majority of people, perhaps unsurprisingly, think that AI regulation is, is required. Um, only 17% of the people in our sample disagree that this is the case. And we also see here um, that 
multiple forms of regulation are, are broadly uh, supported. But it's, 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 it's noticeable that in, particularly in Western countries, in, including Australia, um, there's this general agreement that there's a need for some form of external independent oversight. Um, for example, in Australia, we see that 72% of Australians think that AI should be regulated by the government and or existing regulators, and also um, a dedicated independent AI regulator. Whereas only four, sorry, only 58% of, of Australians believe that it should be regulated by industry. And despite strong expectations of AI regulation, only two in five people actually believe that the current regulations, laws, and safeguards are actually sufficient to really make AI use safe. And a related challenge is that, think, thinking about the Australian data here, almost half of Australians actually have no or low confidence in technology companies and commercial organizations to actually regulate AI in, in the best interests of the public. And you know, around a third of people actually have no or low confidence in the government to, to, to regulate um, appropriately, which is you know, pretty quite concerning. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And just finally, um, in addition to the, the descriptive analyses that, that we run, um, we conducted some quantitative uh, modeling, some predictive modeling, um, to determine what really influences public trust. And our results show that there are, there are these four complementary pathways for supporting trust. Um, and I'll focus on the first one in particular here because I think it's, it's one, it's, it's most relevant to you as, as regulators. But interestingly, it's also the strongest predictor of trust in, in our modeling. And so strengthening this, this institutional pathway really involves strengthening the governance, regulatory and legal safeguards around AI and building confidence in institutions like business and government um, in their enactment of, of, of these safeguards. And so, you know, this is clearly important for, for public trust. But like I mentioned in the previous slide, that the real problem is you know, most people aren't really convinced that the, the current regulatory and governance mechanisms are adequate to protect people, and many aren't particularly confident in business or the government even to govern AI uh, appropriately. So, it, you know, improvements clearly need to be made in, in this area in order to support public trust. Um, so at this point, um, I believe you should see the poll questions pop up. Uh, there we go. Yep, here, here they are. So you may, you, um, there are three questions here. You may need to scroll down to see them all, depending on the size of your screen. Um, and and so when we ask about, you know, to what extent are you currently using AI in, in your role as a regulator? This could be anything from, um, you know, broad organizational activities like uh, customer or employee. Uh, facing chatbots um, to really supporting compliance activities like flagging containers for further inspection or simplifying and enhancing fit and proper persons assessments. Um, and just while you're filling out these, these, uh, these questions, as a brief aside, it's interesting that this PayPal image that Elon Musk shared about two months ago is actually a meme from four years ago. Um, and I'm not, I haven't been able to verify its, its veracity. So Mr. Musk may or may not be peddling misinformation here. Um, and the, the um, image on the right is something that, that I created with the, the help of an AI image generator. I'd be interested to know how, how many of you thought this was an actual photo. Um, I think if you look closely, the, the, the sort of blurring in the skyline makes it quite clear that it's uh, that it's it's not an actual photograph. So um, there you go. So so far, um, I think we still got okay. Um, so around half aren't considering uh, using AI in the roles of um, regulators. Yeah, 
44% planning, very few trialing, um, 1%, one, one person uh, gets it fully deployed. Um, um, so it looks like AI is being used to, uh, to not at all or, or just a little in, in, in your regulatory and it, by your regulated community. And so actually, yeah, very interestingly, even the regulators aren't fully convinced by the, the current safeguards around AI as well. So, you know, it's interesting that that, that broadly um, matches what we found with our public, uh, our, uh, public questionnaire. Um, at, at this point, uh, I will hand back to Simon. Thanks, Dave. Um, now, quite a number of questions in the chat um, related to your presentation, and perhaps um, you can scan them and we can get back to them when we come back to you after uh, Caitlin. So you'll see quite a lot of interest, in, including interesting issues about the potential for fake information to be submitted in court cases, um, uh, you know, fake audio, which I imagine is going to be a challenge when um, sometimes you see images that are, you know, people take smartphone pictures of an, an event um, that where they see a non-compliance and that gets provided to the regulator. Lots of potential issues there. So um, if you'll scan through those and we'll get back to those questions after uh, we hear from Caitlin. So now we're now going to hear from Caitlin, who's going to finish the presentation by taking us through some AI ethics frameworks. So over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Simon. Um, am I sharing my screen now? You are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, just give a very brief overview of kind of where we are in this um, changing regulatory landscape. Uh, in Australia at the moment, we don't have bespoke AI legislation. Uh, we have a non-binding voluntary framework, Australia's AI ethics framework. And you can find out more about that at the link here with the Department of Industry, Science and Resources. Basically, as Steve was speaking about earlier, there are eight principles that are aimed at building public trust, and they're really similar to the trustworthy principles that were developed by the European Commission. So things like human societal and environmental well-being, human-centered values, fairness, privacy protection and security, all the way through to accountability. And you'll remember from what Steve was mentioning that in Australia, we have very strong support for all of these principles and the practices that underpin them. In Australia, the government has also established the National AI Center, which is uh, housed within the CSIRO. And that's meant to help develop the nation's AI and digital ecosystem. And I think really relevant to this audience within here is the Responsible AI Network. And their goal is to drive responsible practice and provide leadership on laws and standards related to AI. It's also important to remember that even though we don't have specific AI legislation in Australia, at least not at the moment, all the existing rules still apply. So for instance, the Privacy Act, which is currently under review, uh, is obviously very relevant and applies um, things like anti-discrimination law. And here is a quote from Ed Santow, Australia's former human rights commissioner, and I'll read it out. I didn't put it up before because I didn't want you to read ahead. Uh, it, it, the law does apply. It needs to be applied. It's just as unlawful to discriminate against someone using an abacus and a human making a decision as it is using the most sophisticated form of neural network or anything in between. And the Human Rights Commission has produced a substantial body of work around the human rights and technology, which includes artificial intelligence. Um, so for this human rights and technology report, uh, they took 291 written submissions and over 700 consultation participants, and they, you know, found that uh, Australians want fair and safe technology, not a surprise, but they recommended that stronger laws and policies are needed to protect our human rights in this space as we move forward, and that by doing that, 
Australia can lead the way in responsible innovation. So not stifle innovation, but find that balance. And the report is really useful. It provides 38 very specific recommendations. One of those I wanted to highlight is it recommends the creation of an AI safety commissioner and their role would be to support regulators, government, and business in applying laws and standards for AI. And you'll remember that Steve mentioned in our survey that there's strong support in Australia for the idea of something like an independent AI regulator. And internationally, there are moves toward regulation. So for example, the European Commission has proposed the AI Act that you can see here. And uh, this uh, would kind of, this is a risk-based approach. It would kind of break things down into three risk categories. So certain AI applications would be deemed to have unacceptable, unacceptable risk and they would be banned. So things like biometric data to identify people in public spaces or things that are manipulating people's behavior in ways that could harm them. So those would just be banned. And then there would be things deemed to be high risk. Um, those can be applications of AI that are used in critical infrastructure or law enforcement or things like uh, ranking job applicants. And those would be subject to strict regulations. And there would be a requirement that there's human oversight. And then low risk applications would have less strict regulation overall. So a risk based approach is what's being proposed. And the United States is also signaling intentions toward increased regulation. And I just wanted to, uh, I, I put this up here. I just wanted to mention that it, there's a bit of a surprise twist here. Uh, in March, just a few weeks ago, the, the United States Chamber of Commerce uh, is calling for regulation of artificial intelligence technology to ensure that it doesn't hurt growth and it doesn't become a national security risk. The reason that I'm saying is that it's a, a bit of a surprise twist as that the US Chamber of Commerce is the largest pro-business lobbying group in the United States. And typically they take a very anti-regulation approach. So uh, it's a bit surprising, but they are calling for a risk-based approach to regulating AI. And, and again, that balance of finding the balance to not stifle innovation like as Simon pointed out. Um, and this week, the um, 12 European Union lawmakers um, are calling for world leaders to hold a summit to find ways to control the development of advanced artificial intelligence systems, so like ChatGPT. Um, and they're calling on the heads of the United States and the European Commission to convene a meeting. If that goes ahead, there may be an opportunity for Australia to make representation in the summit. Um, this follows on from a letter that you might have seen a, a, a couple of weeks ago in the news where more than a thousand technology figures and Elon Musk asked for a six month pause in the development of AI systems that were more powerful than the last iteration of ChatGPT. And just finally, uh, we have written a bit about this uh, with Nicole Gillespie and Steve Lockie, just uh, about how, it, since we have an absence of regulation, AI deploying organizations uh, currently need to be responsible for mitigating the risks of AI systems, because people say they would trust these systems more if oversight tools are in place and organizations can do that. Things like monitoring AI for accuracy and reliability, and creating AI codes of conduct and having independent AI ethics reviews and review boards. But also, uh, I think it's really important to point out, like Steve mentioned, that what we saw from our survey data that Steve presented is that there's very low confidence in Australia for industry to regulate AI use. And so just to sum up, moving forward, um, our survey indicates that there's strong support in Australia for increased regulatory safeguards and there's strong support for an independent AI regulator, uh, which is echoed by the recommendations in the Human Rights and Technology Report that I mentioned earlier. And finally, uh, regulatory agencies may need to create new positions or employ people with technical specialties that are able to interrogate and audit algorithms as a suggestion. 
So thank you. I will now hand back over to Simon. Thank you, Caitlin, and, and thank you, Steve, for your insights as well. We've had quite a number of questions in the chat. Um, Bernadette Highland Wood has uh, sort of called out the fact we can't be complacent because there's lots of very seasoned senior and seasoned software engineers and architects in the US and EU, et cetera, are worried about these large language models. I must say the fact that Elon Musk both called for a pause and then started rapidly recruiting and trying to raise funds to set up his own AI business yeah, truth struck, me, struck me as more a pause until he got his business into gear rather than a pause to save the humanity. But um, perhaps moving on from that, but I think there was a, a question um, towards the end highlighting you know, what the regulators need uh, this skill set question. Um, obviously, we're going to need potentially specialists who have got deep understanding of algorithms, but what about the rest of us who struggle with Teams and Zoom? Um, what sort of uh, AI liter uh, literacy do we need to focus on? Have you got yeah. any suggestions on, apart from attending very uh, productive webinars like today's, have you got other suggestions on ways in which people like ourselves can get up to speed on better understanding of some of the risks and how they can be mitigated? Yeah, well, I mean, my opinion is that we really should be uh, having the, the, these kind of educations broadly, widely early on for the public, um, helping to upskill the public so they can navigate these things so that they can start to consider the risks, you know, their private information and, you know, um, make more informed decisions. Um, and um, also to help policymakers, regulators, uh, business uh, to navigate this. Um, and there is an example uh, of something like this in Finland. They've created this element of AI course really for the whole country and, and, and more broadly, uh, making it free online. Um, there are ways that we can um, start to just uplift our, our, our literacy around AI. And presumably what you were saying was literacy, both, well, all three levels. So, um, businesses so many businesses might inadvertently i mean there's been lots of examples of bias in recruitment through the use of ai and it would seem in most cases that wasn't the intent of the business they just used ai badly so you're suggesting we as regulators or the reg or the ai specialist regulators should focus on educating businesses as well as the community and ourselves as regulators um, Steve, you've had a chance to go through the, some of the questions that were posted earlier. Did you want to respond to any specifically? Oh, sorry, it's on you. Yeah, there was a question around why people might have a preference for a, an independent regulator com compared to a new independent regulator compared to government. And I, I think it's important to, to note that in terms of who who should regulate, you know, that who should regulate question. Um, you know, the percentage that thought both government government and, you know, the percentage of people that said agreed with both government and the new regulator, it was the same. So it seems like there's, you know, there's there's appetite for both. But, you know, the, the I guess the, the, the counterpoint of that is that, you know, quite a number of people aren't that confident in the government to, to, to regulate in, in this respect. And that could be it, you know, obviously, robo debt is 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 still front of mind for people. Now, robo debt it didn't involve any AI such, but it's clearly um, uh, it's it's clearly automated decision making gone wrong and causing you know a, a lot of harm to a lot of people. So maybe that's still kind of front of mind for people. And also, I, I guess the other the other point is. People may just think, oh well, if, if if it's a dedicated and 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 if it's a if it's a dedicated um, uh, regulator, you know, we'll have the right kind of people, like the 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 AI, the, the people that are very knowledgeable about AI and its and its risks and what needs what needs to be done to to counteract those sort of risks. Where you know perhaps people might think, oh well, you know, may, maybe the government won't be quite as across all of these all of these elements. And, and that's why I think something like um, an AI safety commissioner that kind of, it's not like, it's not one regulator to rule them all at all. It's, 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 it's a kind of, I think the idea 
is that it's a, a regulator that supports other regulators in in dealing with AI issues uh, around AI use. I, I think that as a kind of a, a middle ground would be a really, you know, really good idea. And it, it's certainly something that's, it, it seems to be gaining more traction um, again of, of in Australia um, at, at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see where that lands. Hey, Linda, do you want to add anything to that? Um... No, I think that that I, I agree with Steve that uh, the idea of the uh, the safety commissioner, um, I guess, bringing those extra uh, skills into it to actually help support uh, the technical the technical skills, the the knowledge about how to audit algorithms or kind of what to look for to really support the 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 the, the, the other regulators um, when it comes to these um, these these instances with AI or edge cases. Fantastic. Well, I imagine they'll also have a role in working closely with researchers such as yourself, um, because individual regulators, you don't want to be sort of bombarded by uh, 60, well, it's 500 or so regulators across the country. So there'll be an opportunity to sort of coordinate that. So that seems a lot of merit, but it is going to be a challenge getting the right legislative framework in place, as well as the right, right institutional structure. Um, Steve, you had another look. Did you have any other observations about the questions that came up? Um, I, I guess it was um, uh, Ian's question around, um, you know, do regulators need access to AI algorithms and, and specialists um, to understand how algorithms work? Um, in, in those high risk cases, you know, most definitely. And, and it kind of relates to what uh, what Bernadette suggested in her comment that you know you know if there's if there's a if there's an issue you know to, to be able to go to court you know judges and, and regulators are really going to need to understand um, you know how decisions were how outputs uh, came about and um why they came about and what kind of data was used and whether you know whether it was you know it's even lawful to to use that kind of data so i do think that there is going to be a, a need for you know whether it's developing new positions within regulatory organizations comprised of ai specialists or you know maybe you can you know maybe maybe there's some upskilling of, of existing resources but i think it's going to be very important in, in, in certainly in, in in regulatory contexts um, where the risk of AI use is is, is high. I thought I agree that, with that actually, that. and and I think that um, uh, documentation and that mm -hmm. audit trail is just really important in terms of yes. being able to have meaningful accountability, um, uh, having audit auditability in terms of the data that's been used in in the development and then in more refined training and the algorithms and the um and having that 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 audit trail and a clear accountability of who has been involved in what and and, and that audit trail is going to be really essential for for accountability i think it's an interesting observation about the accountability question because i sort of recall uh, the the businesses that you know not every business is going to develop AI itself. A lot of them are going to buy AI products off the off the shelf and then implement them. And they need to be accountable for being smart buyers. They can't yeah. just abrogate their responsibility by saying I bought this particular product from somewhere else. I know that's been a big issue in the US with the use by I think police forces using or the courts using AI to to decide who gets bail or not. And yeah. Um, you know, the, the particular courts can't just abrogate responsibility by saying, well, we bought it off the shelf from someone in somewhere else. So clarifying that accountability, um, I imagine, is going to be critical, which, you know, is still, uh, I suppose, is building on existing accountability mechanisms. We had a comment from here uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee, and I can see why they're anonymous. They said tech regulation has historically been managed by senior figures who are comically technically illiterate, and there is no indication that has changed. I'm hoping that your honesty to me is not talking about me being comically technically illiterate, though the hat might fit. Again, that seems to be a question about how do you upskill not just the technical specialists, but 
right across the organisation. So any observations further about that? Mm. Well, it does resonate. I mean, what, what comes to my mind is, you know, uh, the struggle that we've seen monitoring uh, and keeping accountable social media and watching um, that play out in the, you know, in the chambers of the United States where lawmakers were trying to interrogate about, you know, Facebook algorithms and not understanding what a, you know, a ghost profile was and uh, sort of this, you know, chasing behind um, and not being able to sort of keep up. Um, I think it's a really... Um, important point um, that again um, going to need to be sure that whoever is 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 helping to with the governance of this is going to have the right skills the right people the right support around them and the right audit trails and documentation no fantastic points look we're five minutes to go and so um, I suppose just to make sure that we finish on time, I wonder to finish up if uh, each of you could give your insights into um, what one piece of advice you'd give our regulator community of practice with to take away. Perhaps I'll start with you on that one, Caitlin. Uh, yes. Uh, well, my insights, I mean, I, I think I may have raised more questions than answers, but um, I guess really I would I think the take home message is that there is an appetite for increased safeguards, guardrails, best practices, um, including um, accountability mechanisms, audit trails, documentation, um, so that we can safeguard public trust in AI and so that we can get those benefits. Like you were saying, Simon, um, it isn't to stop AI, but it's to, to, to do it in a way that, you know, we're ensuring public trust and so that these systems are trustworthy. And I guess just to add, I think a really critical piece like we've talked about uh, is that upskilling um, that could be really immediate, um, encouraging uh, business, education, uh, really upskilling everyone, bringing everyone along um, and, and uplifting the AI literacy. Fantastic. I think it's going to be a big job if they establish the regulator to do that to uh, broad, broadly. Steve, have you got any uh, one piece of advice you'd like to leave our uh, participants with? Well, I think Caitlin stole my notes by the by the sounds of it. <laughs> we do work together. <laughs> we do. We do. Um, very much agree with Caitlin. Um, my, I guess my advice would be really make yourself as ready as, as you can possibly be, because things are in a such a state of flux at the moment. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised to see new legislation introduced very soon um, to um, a, a, around the sort of the challenges of of generative AI and, and, and new AI models as, as they as as they're produced. Um, and I think you know it's going to take a lot to be across that. So. You know, make sure that you have people within your organizations that are taking the time to really understand what's going on in this space um, and et cetera. And again, like Caitlin said, maybe maybe that will require a little bit of upskilling or, or perhaps the creation of of new positions or, or new teams. But yeah, really, really sort of keep across it. I mean, this is obviously a, a regular, um, you know, a regulatory community of practice. How about forming a, a uh, regulatory AI community of practice and, you know, keep getting involved with things like this, um, and, you know, uh, talk to AI experts, industry experts, your regulated parties who are, who are starting to use AI or, or have uh, questions around AI policies, that kind of thing. It can only help. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, you've stone, stolen my one insight, which would, would be to um, keep participating in the regulated community of practice sort of events. This is a great opportunity to understand emerging issues. I suspect this, um, we did a session a couple of years ago um, on the broader use of reg tech, and I think that's a, a hot issue across the you know drones and all the various other sort of uh, tools. But this particular tool is a really important one to continue to learn. And I imagine this was, won't be the last of the sessions we have on this topic. Um, final comment, one of the comments in the chat was, you need to be congratulated, the best intro to deeper dive I've heard in the last three months, and I've attended many in the US, EU and Australia, so keep up the good work. So that's from Bernadette, and I'd certainly uh, share that. So well done, team. And I can see all the, the hearts flying across the oh. computer screen as we finish up. So um, 
Just a reminder that there'll be a recording of, from this webinar will be available on the Anzog YouTube channel in about two weeks. Um, YouTube, another user of AI, which has been less constructive in some ways, but it's great for seeing Anzog uh, recordings. So that'll be available in two weeks and um, you can share that with your friends and colleagues. Um, you'll also get a feedback survey that you'll receive today. Um, so Anzog is always keen to get feedback from um, the several hundred people who are involved in this today to see what you'd like to hear more of. Um, and the next um, webinar coming up, uh, there's a hybrid event in Adelaide in South Australia, um, and further details will be coming soon for those of you in Adelaide, but it'll be hybrid, so it'll be available for others. And it's data, data everywhere, challenges, lessons, and opportunities for regulators, which is very much aligned with what we've been covering off today. So thank you, everyone, uh, for your participation, and thank you particularly to Caitlin and Steve. So well done.